Good morning and welcome to this public he hearing of Columbus City Council's Health and Human Services Committee. I am Council Member Priscilla Tyson, Chair of the Health and Human Services Committee. Before getting started, I want to make everyone aware that this hearing has been recorded for rebroadcast on CTV, the Columbus Government Television Channel 3. The rebroadcast schedule is available at www.columbus.gov. The purpose of today's hearing is to share with the public information about the programs and services provided by various city-funded social service agencies. As we anticipate another cycle of social services grants funding later this year, a process that you will hear about momentarily, I've also asked organizations to focus on their success stories that have resulted from their programs, and additionally, presenters have been asked to identify the gaps in services that we can address through the social service programs. This is a second of two hearings that will allow nearly every nonprofit organization receiving city funds through the competitive grant process to provide updates on their programs. Yesterday we heard from 17 organizations and today we will hear from 16 organizations. We enjoy a high quality of life in Columbus that is marked with innovation and collaboration. However, even the greatest cities have challenges and we need to make sure that our residents have the resources and services that they need to better their lives. We are well positioned to address many of the needs of our residents because we have a strong infrastructure of governmental, nonprofit, and private sector resources and organizations that are dedicated to offering services that are vital to our community. This morning, we will hear from city-funded social service agencies who are doing important work in our community to help people who are in need. After our guests have testified, we will entertain testimony from members of the public who have submitted speaker slips for this hearing. Before beginning with testimony, I would now like to turn it over to Hannah Jones from the Department of Development to provide a brief overview of the human service funding. I would also like to note that we have in the audience next to um, Ms. Jones, we have Kim Stans, who many of you work with. Kim works within the department to maintain and manage the service contracts. So I know all of you know him. And so Ms. Jones, um, the floor is yours. Thank you and good morning, Chair Tyson. In February of this year, City Council approved the 2018 budget for the City of Columbus. This budget included the overall human services budget, which is approximately $5 million. 2,627,000 of that comes from the general fund and 2,373,000 of that comes from the emergency human services fund. These funds support our social service agencies and the services that they provide to the Columbus residents. Of the $5 million, $4.1 million is allocated to 31 organizations that were originally awarded grants through our competitive process in 2014. These organizations administer 38 programs that address the needs of Columbus residents in three priority areas. The first is Safety Net, which encompasses emergency and basic needs services. The second is Economic Success, which really focuses on employment and self-sufficiency initiatives. And the third is social success, which really looks at how do we create safe and healthy individuals, relationships, and neighborhoods throughout our city. The original intent of the competitive process was to have a new cycle every three years. However, in 2018, a one-year extension was provided for the current grantees while the administration determined a strategy and process for a new round of funding. As a first step in the process, we are convening an intra-departmental working group to evaluate the funding and grant support that is given by each department in the city, identify where resources can be aligned and streamlined, and also discuss where the gaps are for the populations that we as a city serve. That conversation is currently ongoing. This working group will serve as a baseline for a broader conversation with the human services community to identify where and how to target our resources in 2019 and beyond. And these two hearings really serve as the starting point for that conversation in the beginning of that feedback. This collective dialogue will inform us on the areas of focus for the next competitive round. It is our goal to have the priorities solidified and a process identified for the next round by early May of 2018. 
with an anticipated application process which would begin in July of this year and selection to be coordinated with the announcing of the 2019 budget in November. As we begin discussion regarding a new round of funding, it is important to reflect on what we have accomplished with the previous one. This support has served families, immigrants and refugees, justice involved men and women, veterans and the LGBTQ communities of Columbus. We have addressed food insecurity, provided child care and education supports, addressed addiction and helped support mental and physical health needs for our residents, as well as addressing unemployment and underemployment. We've seen millions of pounds of produce distributed to families throughout our city. city excuse me. 13,000 households have received food assistance over these three years. And we've seen 200 neighborhood-based projects that have been supported that help build community pride and engagement for our residents. Thousands of residents were able to be to partake in free high quality tax assistance services, which then enabled them to benefit from receiving millions in tax refunds. Through this process, we have learned that nonprofits thrive with accountability and technical assistance. That's important that we work to create a sustained and collective effort focused on communication and collaboration amongst all of the partners that serve the city. We have also been able to emphasize this import, the importance of thinking big, starting small, and scaling up. We appreciate the continued support of you and your staff, as well as your colleagues at City Council, and look forward to hearing from each organization as they share their respective accomplishments this year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. And um, as I mentioned yesterday, this particular hearing, um, yesterday and today, are really um, two of my favorite days to be here because I get to hear from these wonderful nonprofit organizations that are really doing amazing work in our community. So I just want to say thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your service to this community. The reason that we're, I've asked today to hear about your successes um, and any gaps that, um, that you are seeing in terms of our human services in our community is because um, I know that each of you, from talking with Ms. Mr. S Mr. Kim Stans as well as um, Ms. Jones, that each of you either have already met your goals or are on target of meeting the goals of the grant. And so um, I just want to hear, again, the successes and what is still lacking from your perspective in the community. And so again, thank you for being here, and we will now start the hearing. Our first presenter, and you'll see there's a schedule on the, um, on the TV monitors, but it is, um, first will be the Heritage Day Health Centers, and then the Southside Learning and Development, Godman Gill, Mary Haven. And so we will now start with the Heritage Day Health Centers doing business as the National Church Residence Center for Senior Health at Champion and Pondexter. And so if Andy, I don't know who's here, but the names of Andy Waller or Heather Fleshman and whomever's gonna be speaking on behalf of them, just please come to the podium and, um, and share your comments. Good morning. Good morning, Council Member Tyson, and thank you for having us today and helping us improve the quality of life um, for both our seniors and our children at our near east side, um, near east side of Columbus. My name is Heather Fleshman. I am the Director of Clinical Services for National Church Residences Centers for Senior Health, and I would like to introduce Sandy Waller, who is our Site Manager of our Champion Intergenerational Center that works directly with the seniors and children of that community. Thank you for having us. Today, National Church Adult Day Center's Champion Intergenerational serves 109 clients at the intergenerational side, and we also have served over 140 children from Columbus Early Learning Center. Okay. Better, okay. Um, our nurses at Champion Intergenerational, they do a, bi a weekly a wellness clinic across the street at Point Dexter Village. They also are the hub for a lot of community center um, activities and the community is allowed to come in and check with the nurse to have things you know their blood pressure checked and everything in addition to our nurses they work with the Columbus Early Learning Center and their eye screenings and BMI our nurses made friends with many of the children and that helps them so they do not fear going to the going to a nurse or to the doctor's office 
She also heads up a lunch bunch group with his seniors and the kids share a meal together in a small setting. Our families are very grateful for National Church for having a nurse on site. One of our clients came to our center in April of 2015. Jack was in the first stages of Alzheimer's. His family needed to work. So they were, we were able to care for him because we did have a nurse on site. Jack's family was very comfortable knowing our nurse was right there. Jack was very active in all the intergenerational activities. He had made many friends with the kids. He was always lending a hand to them. Jack started to change and had many different difficult challenges. The kids who knew Jack from when he first started never saw any difference. They knew he had changed and they saw his challenges now. So they turned into Jack's helpers. With us having a nurse on site, it was possible for Jack to spend his time with us and enjoy being out and with the kids. The intergenerational, the one thing, with the intergenerational, the one thing that I have learned and all of us have learned is the children saw the person and not the illness. So we want to thank you for the grant that we received for the, from the City of Columbus that is able to provide care for our seniors and our children at Champion Intergenerational Center, and thanks for all the support. Thank you, Sandy. And I will ask either Sandy or Heather, are there any challenges that you're seeing um, in the work that you're doing each and every day? the challenges is that you can get closer with, so I can hear yeah. okay. one of the challenges um, that we do face is when um, the children um, do move on to kindergarten we do see some of the clients get disappointed because they've developed a relationship with these with these um, children so um, you know a fresh batch comes in you know and they're um, we, we've seen great improvements with our seniors you know I mean they have a purpose for coming to the center and it also has been a positive aspect in the children's lives as well Thank you. the one last question I'll ask is that do you see that there is a, um, a need for more residents are asking for your services or families are asking for your services and you're able to meet yes yeah, so far we're able to meet them and i think going on we're always going to make sure we get to provide for them um, we see a large group of clients interested in our program now because of the aging so hopefully we would just keep being able to do what we do and have the support from the city and and you know any other organization Okay, well thank you very much and for caring for um, our youngest residents of Columbus and our seniors and, um, and thank you. It's always great when you, the story that you show the, the success of um, Jack, I appreciate that story and uh, thank you for able to meet um, his and his family's needs. And your organization is receiving $101,420 to support this program. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you very much. Have a Thank wonderful you. day. Our next presenter is going to be from the Southside Learning and Development Center is Amy Valentine. And after Amy will be the Godman Guild Association. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Um, well, today I'm going to speak about the program that the city is graciously funding for us. It's Successful Beginnings. Um, the south side of Columbus is among the highest infant, Im, the infant mortality rates in the country. Recent, recent statistics indicate that more than three babies die in our community every week. As reflected in the Roadmap to Revitalization Southern Gateway Community Report, May 2014, the Southern Gateway families have significant higher at-risk factors when compared to the city or the county. The purpose of Successful Beginnings is to reduce infant mortality by providing care to at-risk infants and mentoring and support of the, uh, of the mothers. One of our most recent successes is Kamari. Kamari was born 13 weeks premature and as a result spent the first three and a half months of her life in the hospital. Kamari was delayed for her age and when she enrolled in our center we worked with her. Um, Kamari's teachers have worked with both Kamari and the mom 
to improve Kamari's self-help skills, her large and small motor skills, her language skills, and social skills. Working with SSL and DC and Help Me Grow has improved Kamari's overall development, and she is now testing at her appropriate developmental age. Um, next week, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> next week, we have an 11-week-old baby enrolling into the um, Successful Beginnings program. The mother is a 19-year-old who is just um, coming out of the foster care system. So, of course, she's going to need a lot of support. Um, because of the funding that we receive from the city, we are able to enroll her child, mentor her parenting skills, and empower her to set goals and engage with programs that are on site at the Reeb Avenue Center where we're located. And uh, hopefully this will support her pathway to future success. These are just a few of the families. Uh, we currently have eight slots that we um, have available funded through the city in this program. Uh, we are hopeful that in time we might be able to even increase those slots because we do see a huge need. But I appreciate you having me here today. I know I kind of talk fast, but thank you so much for the funding. We really do appreciate it. Um, thank you, Amy. And so you just mentioned, so you have eight slots available that's available now? Or right. For, well, so, total. That's that's what the grant So for Oh, so you have eight for. slots total. Yes. Mm -hmm. And are all eight slots filled right Th now? They currently are, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there, um, well, tell me, are there any um, gaps or challenges that you see um, in the work that you're doing each and every day? Um, I, I don't really see any gaps or challenges. Um, our teaching staff is so qualified and they really love these children and they try to help the families as much as possible. Um, I would say the only challenge would be, you know, needing more funding for more slots. Um, we do see a huge need for these infant slots and, um, you know, that's, that's probably the biggest challenge that we face. So right now, if, so are you, a, are you able to provide services to everyone that's requesting services from you? No, not right now, okay. because we are limited to just the eight slots that we currently have. You know, it's, we really How we many? have had to say we've got a waiting list, you know, but we, we like to provide immediate care, but you know, right now there is a waiting list. So tell me how many people are on your waiting list. For the successful beginnings program, probably three. Okay. And is that a normal number, three, or is it, does it? More than likely, yeah. Um, I, I would say three on average. Okay. And then we also work with Ohio State University with the Early Head Start program. And um, for, for the children to be Early Head Start through OSU, they want the families to qualify for publicly funded child care as well to just offset some of those costs. Um, for the children, and, and that's why we use successful beginnings as well. If they don't qualify for publicly funded child care, we're still able to partner with OSU and the Early Head Start program and help these families still get the support they need. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you for the work that you do with, um, you know, our, our, like I said, our most newest residents. And thank you for the work. I'm glad that Kamari is now testing at her um, appropriate age. And yeah. hopefully as she continues to move forward that through um, continuing on with preschool, that she will get continue to stay at that level and, um, and be a successful student. So yeah. thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. You as well. Godman Gill. Good morning. Ms. Ms. Mock? Yes. All right. Restate your name and um, then you can make your presentation. I'm Tracia Mock with the Godman Gildeson. This better? I'm Tracia Mock with the Godman Guild Association. I'd like to thank you, Councilmember Tyson, for inviting the Godman Guild to share the impact of our Pathways to Work program made possible by funding from the City of Columbus. Like I stated before, I'm Tracia Mock, and I'm the Director of Employment Programs at the Godman Guild. The Pathways to Work program has connected our unemployed and hard to employ neighbors to employers that would not have normally hired them. These city residents face many barriers that include the lack of childcare, safe housing, and transportation. A majority enter our program as former felon and non-felon offenders, their background checks prevent them from being able to gain employment. Our participants also face mental health and past addiction issues. 
All of these barriers combine to make the prospect of finding work feel overwhelming and impossible. This is where we come in at. We help these individuals conquer their barriers and develop confidence, hope, great work habits, and skills so they become and remain assets to their employers. With the Godman Guild as the employer record, our participants get to earn an hourly wage or training stipend. Over the course of four to three months, they work part-time on job crews, conduct job shadowing, participate in customer service and leadership training, and prepare for permanent full-time employment. They do this with the extensive assistance of our social worker, on-site social worker, job coaches, academic instructor, and work readiness coordinator. Our partner employers have the opportunity to observe and vet their pathway candidate and to ensure that when they make that job offer, they're getting a work ready, high quality employee. I'd like to share some feedback from one of our partner employees, Dan Cements, who is the director of MFG operations, Donato's Pizza, Jane Doe's Food. He told us working with God McGill has been a great experience for all of us at Donato's. We have been able to make several permanent hires in a relatively short period of time. The support we've received from our God McGill job coach has been fantastic. He works hand in hand with our line leaders to support the God McGill folks to help with their development. I will highly recommend this avenue to any employer who may be interested. We know our employer partners appreciate this program and we know that the program changes our participants lives. Please allow me to share Melody's story. Melody's multiple barriers included legal issue, court fines, single parenting, lack of transportation, and communication issues. She avoided attention and did not like making eye contact. She started on a transitional jobs career at the Roots Cafe, but soon dropped out. A few months later, she came back with a stronger determination to succeed. She resolved her legal issues, we developed a plan for transportation, and addressed her court fines. With her job coach, she worked on her communication skills and increased her confidence. In July 2017, Melody enrolled in the Pathways to Work Career Bridges Ohio Health Program, began training for full-time work. She successfully, successfully attended all elements of the nine-week training program and then interviewed for a full-time position in environmental services at Riverside Hospital. Today, six months later, she's still working full-time and is looking forward to her career advancement within the Ohio Health System. We have assisted over 115 Columbus residents like Melody gain permanent employment. Over 60 have retained their employment for over three months. Our partners include City of Columbus, Franklin County Job and Family Services, PNC Bank, United Way, and our employer partners are Middle Ohio Food Bank, Roots Cafe, Donato's Jane Doe Bakery, Ohio Health, and Nationwide Children's Hospital. We're currently looking for additional funding and employer partnership. If anybody would like more information, please visit the Godman Guild website, call us, or reach, us, reach out to us on social media. Thank you for allowing me to share about Pathways to Work. Thank you for your time, interest, and investment into our program. Thank you, Ms. Mock. And um, certainly, it's great to hear the successful story of Melody. And I know that um, we were also supportive of the Ohio, Ohio Health Program. So it's great that she is there and can start a career within um, the Ohio Health Organization. Can you share with me, are there any um, challenges, gaps that you're seeing um, with the individuals you're working with? Um, just any, or the or organizations that you're trying to place people, find jobs for people, just anything that you have that we need to know about. Absolutely. We have, we have more participants than we have employers. Our, we're in, currently looking for less restricting employers, employers. Some of the employers that we have our partnership with, they're really strict on their background checks. And with so many of our participants coming in with background issues, it's really hard to place those, and we only have a limited lot of spots for a less restricted employer. Okay. So um, this is an opportunity for um, organizations that um, and individuals who may be listening or viewing or this hearing that if you have opportunities for individuals that have gone through your program, which is an amazing program, uh, as you said, we have you, know, you have coaches, counselors that you are that you follow up with them while they're on the job to make sure they're successful, any barriers they have, you're working them out, that if you're willing to give an individual that has a background an opportunity to continue to move forward in their lives, that to contact you at Godman Gill and come out and visit the program and look for some really good people that want to continue to work. 
I think that people who have backgrounds, once something, and they realize that the company knows they have a background, what we have seen in our Restoration Academy program, that they're some of the best employees that you can find based upon they're so happy to have a job and they're not looking over their shoulder once they get a job and thinking about, will they find out about my background, I'm gonna lose my job. So I thank you for your work, and again, we absolutely need to make sure that more employers are um, flexible in, to hiring individuals that are, have returned back to our community. Thank and you. I thank you for your work. I thank, um, you know, tell Ellen I said hello, and I think I see Kat in the back, is that, is that Kat you back do. there taping? Um, and the audience, so thank you for your leadership. Thank you. And, I, and you're, you're funded at, let me see, I think $426,704. Yes. All right, thank, thank you. you very much. Our next presenter is going to be from Mary Haven. And um, let's see who's, oh, okay, we have, is it Ben and Mike? Good morning. Good morning, Council Member Tyson. Thank you again for uh, inviting us out this morning. My so name, welcome. I'm sorry. Mike Gertz uh, from Medically Assisted Services. On behalf of Mary Haven, our patients and their families, we would like to genuinely thank the City of Columbus and City Council on your continuous support and dedication to treating addictive illness and mental health in our community. As you may know, Mary Haven is the oldest and most comprehensive behavioral health facility in the area, operating since 1953. Our residential detox facility hosts a 32-bed unit aimed at providing high-quality medical, psychiatric, and behavioral health services to patients suffering from substance abuse disorders and mental illness. In this unit alone, we treat approximately 2,000 patients each year. Through the generous contribution made by the City of Columbus and City Council, we were able to treat 134 patients in our subacute detox facility over the past 12 months. These 134 patients were awarded the opportunity to restore their lives. These 134 patients, mothers, fathers, sons, and daughters, were given the special gift of recovery. The special gift of recovery to me is the greatest gift that can ever be given and the greatest gift that can ever be received. From the bottom of my heart, I, along with Mary Haven, these 134 patients and their families, sincerely thank you. Thanks again for the opportunity to present. My name's Ben Arnold. I work with adolescents at Mary Haven. Uh, I have done so for, gosh, the last uh, 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 decade uh, or more. Um, I want to thank, uh, we value obviously the ability to provide a valuable service. We uh, treat substance use disorder and, and dual diagnosis uh, uh, youngsters at our facility in a secure therapeutic milieu. Um, we utilize city funding to provide services for uh, those services that may be out of reach for a lot of uh, folks and their insurance coverage and that aren't involved with other uh, child serving agencies that could, could better assist them. Um, we've been fortunate since uh, 2014 that the city supported a level of two uh, full time beds or 730 days of treatment. Uh, we anticipate usually around 16 patients a year. Um, uh, though we did exceed that this last year. Uh, last year we've been busy, we had 96 total discharges uh, from our program, had almost 8,000 days of treatment that we provided with an average occupancy of 22 and our, our length of stay was around 87 days. Um, obviously our goal is to return to the community uh, youngsters with improved functioning as it relates to their uh, substance use disorder, uh, decreased problem behavior, and, and improved school performance. Um, 
Uh, I do uh, wanted to kind of talk uh, quickly about a story. We have a youngster, uh, Troy, that was engaged in regular substance use and uh, risky behaviors in the community, which resulted in need uh, for services. Parents sought out treatment. Um, during his time in, in family counseling and his treatment, he was able to uh, learn to kind of control his behavior some, reduce his impulsivity, and was able to learn how to um, keep an open line of communication with family. Um, he even bonded with his father during treatment, and they were able to engage in some pro-social activities together, which was very supportive. Um, obviously, uh, mother had, uh, upon follow-up, reported that he had continued down the path of sobriety, continued with outpatient services, and uh, no longer uh, requires attendance at a behavioral school, and has actually started looking for employment. All right. Well, thank you for sharing that story. And um, before I mention, speak a little bit more, tell me, are there any, for either of you, um, Ben or Mike, what challenges are you seeing, um, you know, in the community that um, are unmet? Uh, just if you would just, you know, both of you may want to speak on it. I'm, I'm flexible, but go ahead. Yeah, Mike and I actually had a discussion about that, and it seems to be a similar theme regardless of age. A lot of it tends to center around housing. We, we tend to have a lot of youngsters that, that need, maybe they don't have as much family involvement, so they need other support such as uh, seeking appropriate housing or somewhere to, to reside uh, post-treatment. Um, and then we also have issues with kind of uh, developing uh, employment avenues and, and uh, vocational, you know, uh, services as well. Are you speaking in, in employment for youth or um, employment just for, for all the people that you're working with just that you've talked about today? I think all ages, but pr certainly the adult uh, uh, services mm -hmm. uh, more so than the kids, because a lot of our youngsters are 15. And so you're saying, is it why are why are they having a difficulty getting gaining employment? Many times our patients come in and they have a a, a, a um, long record of being um, out of the workforce. And so to re-enter the workforce can be challenging in many ways. Um, you know, with a new life in recovery, um, you know, the, skill, the skills building is really important to attain. And I think that is something that, uh, you know, we would like to pursue, you know, on a uh, agency level. And so um, the speakers that were just um, ahead of you from Gottman Gill, and I don't know if you work with them already. Do. You do? Okay, so that's a connection. Because it's important that we're connecting to um, employment organizations that um, have, ha or ha have had success in terms of working with individuals who've been out, as, you, as they just mentioned, being out of the um, individuals who've been out of the workforce for a period of time require um, a different level of um, of skills and those to be provided to them by organizations for them to be able to move forward their lives. And so I'm glad you're connecting with um, Gottman Guild. I think that um, Impact or other organizations too that are out here. Because again, um, and I'm glad that you know Kim's here and Kim's writing notes that we need to understand what the challenges are. We get through treatment. And then um, individuals still probably need their coach in terms of a, jo a job coach, but they also need to make sure they're having um, staying within treatment because there is a new illness. And again, we know that you know life just brings challenges no matter what your situation is. And having that person that is still there to help them through their sobriety is is key. Mm -hmm. The other question so that I just want to ask, especially about youth, and um, or um, talk to me a little bit about, um, do you have enough, you know, beds or the services for the for youth based upon maybe the need in the community? I think that there's always opportunity to to increase services. Um, we we find oftentimes we have to reach out to schools uh, to to 
educate about capacities that we have available and the types of services we provide. Um, there are times where, unfortunately, we aren't able to provide uh, services based on, you know, um, the lack of, of some funding at times. So it's nice to be able to use the, the, the grant funding to be able to provide those services. Um, insurance, as you know, oftentimes you, you have limited benefits or, or opportunity to, to serve some families. And, you know, oftentimes they're calling us in a very desperate moment, you know, for their youngsters. So it, it you know, certainly I think there's always room for more expansion. Because you have more demand than you're able to provide. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. And so for the Mary Haven Adolescent Program, um, the, the city funds the program at, for $271,068. And for the Mary Haven Detox Program, it's $221,280. And, and $80. The last question, this is such an important, and I promise I'm finished asking this question, but um, talk to me a little bit about um, when we first, when this, when this grant was first given, which is now four years ago, we certainly weren't talking as much about the issue of addiction and people understanding it, bring brain illness, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so um, obviously now that we are having, it appears to be um, more individuals for various reasons are now, um, have been, are addicted. Mm -hmm. That, ha have you seen the numbers grow coming to your, to Mary Haven? Would that be a true statement? More need? Yeah, absolutely. So I know personally you uh, have the um, desire and the need on a personal level to help so many people, you know, outside of the official work that you do. And I'm really appreciative and thankful for that. I know this um, is near and dear to you. Um, so our phones are constantly ringing all day long for, for the need f for our services. Um, you know, we have our subacute detox facility at, on Alum Creek, but uh, about two months ago, we also opened up our addiction stabilization center on South High Street. We're having great success um, with treating patients there. Um, we've already had two, 200 patients who have come in through the doors, and 90% uh, of those have uh, continued on to further treatment. So I don't think there's enough space here in town to treat the uh, the uh, epidemic that we are currently facing. Thank you. I'm glad when I was asking challenges, I'm glad that I asked more questions because I know that's a fact and I certainly know that um, in terms of residential treatment, especially um, long-term residential treatment, which some individuals certainly need, um, and that could be up to a couple of years where they need to, you know, so their their brain is now um, returning to it, trying to turn, return to its normal state and all the supportive services that are needed for individuals that have addiction illness. And so, um, I, so I thank you for your work. Certainly we know that there's a greater need for services in this community and, um, and that's what we've been having some conversations about, just the needs of a community this period. And now this one is, um, um, is substantial. So I thank you. I mean, it's, you guys, you could see the sincerity of, um, of you and how much you care about the work that you're doing. And I thank you for that. And, um, and I'm glad we're able to be supportive. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so mm -hmm. much. Let's see. Our next speaker is going to be from the Mental Health America of Franklin County, the Perinatal Outreach and Encouragement for Moms program. And, and before you start, Tanya, let me ask my staff one question. All right, good, we're good. Okay, all right, thank you. You can go ahead and start. Good morning, Chair Tyson. Good morning. Thank you for your ongoing support and for allowing me to share today. 
POEM, or Perinatal Outreach and Encouragement for Moms, is Mental Health America's comprehensive, of course free, maternal mental health program that offers a full menu of specialized services and specifically addresses access to care issues. So highlighting successes, I'm pleased to say that the strategic initiatives we envisioned as part of this grant program funded through the City of Columbus have been among the most instrumental in the growth of this program. In 2017, we served 816 mothers and families, nearly 500 of which were the result of the direct referral interface for providers that we instituted as part of this project. And we're continuing to build partnerships. When we applied for this funding, we envisioned serving 250 families a year. Um, so our outcomes for the past two years show um, that 92% of, of our moms who um, report in have shown a significant reduction in depression and anxiety symptoms, an increase in coping skills um, and dealing with daily problems, and an increase in what we call informational support, which is that we can verify successful connections to appropriate health and social service programs in addition to ours. With this program, we have trained 40 new peer mentors, all of which are survivors of postpartum disorders, who annually facilitate 36 support groups and provide an average of 700 hours of mentoring services. I'm also pleased to share that this program was recognized with a national award in 2017 called the Innovative Programs in Care from two national organizations, 2020 Mom and the Marseille Society. I'll share a brief story, and this is, um, this is in the words of Kara, uh, mom to Zion. She says, after two years and four losses, I had finally reached full term, 37 weeks, carrying a baby. I could finally stop worrying and being anxious about something bad happening. Because of a complication, um, Zion was in the NICU for a week, um, but I was finally able to bring him home. But I no longer had help to take care of him and myself. I quickly started showing signs of depression and anxiety, but suffered silently because I didn't want to admit to anyone just how bad it was. I was ashamed and felt so alone until I was referred to POEM. Thank God for the resources that were made available to me through POEM. I could talk to and connect with other moms in group meetings and online. I was connected to a therapist. I was even assigned a mentor who called to check on me and allowed me to call and text her whenever I needed to. I feel like utilizing these tools has allowed me to be a better mom to my son. Thank you to POEM for helping me. Shifting to the question about um, identifying gaps and priorities. So I mentioned that we served um, about 800 moms um, in, uh, in our community, but what we know is statistically about 4,000 women and families may have a diagnosable um, perinatal mental illness. Um, so while we have increased um, our partnerships, um, we feel that this model can be um, more widely adopted to reach um, the women and families that can benefit our services. And what we know about gaps is that you know, suicide is the uh, second most common cause of postpartum mortality. Uh, we know that maternal depression and anxiety are stronger risk factors for child behavior, child behavior problems than smoking, binge drinking, and abuse. Um, that depressed mothers are less likely to adopt safe sleep practices and have higher rates of smoking, both of which, which are key initiatives in our infant mortality work. So we've developed this model that we feel has strong outcomes, um, but there, there's certainly more room to have it more universally accessed among the services um, that intersect with pregnant parenting families in our community. Um, and we look to partner with additional um, folks to be able to expand this work. Again, we're, we're so grateful for your ongoing support and allowing us to serve mothers in this city. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Fullwider. That um, one, congratulations on getting those two national awards. Thank you. Um, which is showing that there's an innovative program going on in Columbus that's working. And for serving um, 816 moms and ensuring that, as you mentioned with Kara, that who said she had four losses. Mm -hmm and that she was able, and that again, um, um, put something that we don't wanna see as we're focusing on just infant mortality, mm -hmm. but four losses, 
and then after having a pretty healthy baby, that she then became a little overwhelmed by everything and that you were there to ensure that, um, that her son continues to move forward and that um, she now sees that she can be a successful mom, which means she'll also have a successful child because it all goes together. Absolutely. And so this is a great program. Uh, I thank you for your leadership and your commitment. And certainly we have heard that there's 4,000 women in this community that can utilize those services. And again, that just goes right with infant mortality. And so right. we, um, and also having a healthy, and if you get past that, that's certainly that, um, those children will be able to be in healthy families. So I thank you for coming down and, uh, and sharing your success story. And you've done all that work and you've received from the city to do this program $32,270. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is gonna be Mr. Luther Tyson um, from Impact Community Action. Good morning. Good morning, Councilwoman Tyson. Um, thank you for your continued support of our Employment Plus Work Readiness Program. We very much appreciate it. Um, we serve about 250 job seekers every year, and out of those 250 people, about 72% of those people will find livable wage employment. And thanks to your contribution, you've been, made a game-changing difference in the lives of a lot of those people. One thing I'd like to do is share a couple of stories by two very different participants of ours to let you know the impact of the program and also talk about some of the challenges we have identified and what we hope to do about them, thanks to your help. And one participant, I won't say her whole name, her name was Marie, but she was a Hispanic woman, mother of four, who migrated here, or excuse me, migrated, who um, transferred here from New Mexico. Uh, according to her, she grew up in extreme poverty and had suffered a lot of challenges. And although she's a very intelligent person, we found she was extremely shy and unwilling to kind of express herself. Um, after graduating this program, she said one of the biggest benefits she had was learning how to speak in front of other people. And she was able to successfully find a customer service job that paid her $12.50 an hour, which was more than she had previously been able to earn with her skill set. She also, um, through the program, we emphasize people learning to use existing skills and hobbies and interests to develop supplemental income streams for herself. And she found that her bilingual skills, um, had, there was a demand for that in the community. And she found a way to start developing um, her skills as a translator, helping immigrants file their paperwork, find legal paths to citizenship, and just do things that would necessarily, where language might be a barrier. And that became a supplemental income stream for her. And she's very happy now. A second participant who's very opposite, um, Marie, her name was Yolanda. She came to us with a manslaughter conviction hanging over her head and um, a history of being fired from jobs. She was perceived by a lot of people as aggressive and uh, had problems with authority and so on. But after talking to her, the truth is she was just frustrated and she had problems with um, literacy. And so when she was put in situations where those kind of issues were exposed, it made her feel a little agitated. But we were helped her to identify a skill set that was consistent with who she was as a person. And she was able to find work in the construction employment industry. And she found a contract labor job, because we um, share with people that the world of work is a very big place. And if you can't find full-time employment with benefits, that doesn't mean you have to be poor. So we helped her and several others find contract labor jobs at $20 per hour, which was enough to help her pay her bills without necessarily having the benefits of full-time employment that a lot of us enjoy. And since then, she's um, gone on from the Employment Plus program to graduate from our vocational training and certification program. And she just interviewed with a glass installation company a couple days ago, and the, inter the interview went really well. If they hire her, you know, she'll be working permanently with benefits at $17 an hour starting. So that's good. Now, one of the issues that we've identified over the course of doing this training is that a lot of our um, people, even though they're able to find jobs, most of those jobs are entry-level jobs. And the affordable housing crisis and a lot of other things still put people in a position where they still qualify for services from impact because they simply can't make ends meet. So one of the things we have done, thanks to the help of this program, you have give us the financial bandwidth to expand and modify some of our training strategy. So without abandoning our initial mission to serve people who need entry-level employment, we've been able to provide additional vocational training with employment partners to help people find skills, not only in the construction industry, but STNA, 
lobotomy. We had 11 people graduate from um, CDL training, driving trucks. And so now people feel confident that regardless of their barriers, if they can find a way to make a living for themselves and support their families legally and um, <laughs> you know, move forward. And so I think it's been a big boost to our program. So we want to thank you for that. Because right now, the biggest issue that we are identifying is the issue of underemployment. And thanks to you all, we expect in the next year to continually expand our vocational training program. We have partners with the unions, partners with uh, Franklin County to um, help people find union tracks. And today, our first class of Building Futures is graduating, and those people will have um, three, four, or five-year apprentices apprenticeships where they'll get journeyman cards in carpentry, plumbing, mechanical engineering, all sorts of things. So it's a wonderful thing and we thank you for your support. You said that they're graduating today from, yes. from the program that they've already been in apprenticeship programs? Yeah, our, our program has three tracks when people graduate from Employment Plus. They can either go directly to employment or we can continue to work with them, job coach them into a vocational training track or the union training track. And so we've had pe those two stories, Ms. Yolanda and the people from Building Futures have been ushered into those vocational training tracks after they did their core training through Employment Plus. Thank you. And so the biggest issue is just underemployment that you're saying. Mm -hmm. And then that's where this program comes in to try mm -hmm. to help people get into the jobs that, um, so that they're not being, um, they're paying a live, being paid a livable wage. So, I mean, I've, this question is, are you able to meet the needs of in, all the individuals that are coming to you? I mean, the question is, do you have enough slots or enough for people that want to get into the programs at Impact? Well, actually, we have a waiting list for the vocational training program, about 70 people, and there are about 30, 28 70 people, people. 70 people. And there are 28 people waiting for the current um, core skills training and employment plus. So we don't have enough to serve everyone. And some of the people that come to us have, um, you know, we kind of do a screening process, and if they have barriers that we don't think we can overcome in a four or five week period, we'll refer them to some other program like COVA or someplace else that can help them, you know, deal with those barriers prior to getting into work readiness. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, Mr. Tyson, thank you for certainly coming down and sharing your success stories and the, from Marie and Yolanda, which are two very different stories, but how you're able to help them build their confidence. And now they're making a livable wage in our community. Um, see, Miss Marie has now started up her, her own purse, her own business, which is great. Mm -hmm. And um, and that certainly wouldn't happen without the work of your organization to provide the skills, but also, and, and, and the same for Got Me Gill and all the other programs, it requires building people up. Whether, you know, the Mary Haven programs, you require to build people up so that they know that they can be successful to move forward. And so I thank you for your leadership. Please tell Bo a hello, thank you, congratulations today on this big graduation. We'll tell them. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And I shouldn't say how much money you guys are getting. You are receiving um, $110,640 $110, for your programs. Thank you. Our next presenter is going to be from Catholic Social Services Counseling Program and correct? Sorry. Yes, and tell I'm, I'm sure, well, they're moving this too fast, so let me look here. Miss, tell me, is, is it Sabri? Sabri Akinyele. Okay, thank you. You're All right, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm happy to be here to represent Catholic Social Services. I first want to thank uh, the City of Columbus for supporting our counseling program. Um, Catholic Social Services has a rich history of providing quality mental health counseling services. However, there is a segment of the population in Columbus, in the Columbus community, that has a significant mental health issues which are exacerbated by the host of social determinants such as poverty, unemployment, homelessness, and violence within the home and community. And there's also an ever-increasing problem of housing instability, because many of our families face uh, the possibility of eviction each month. Over the past several years, with the funding that we have received, we have been able to expand our maternal counseling program. This program strives to serve pregnant and parenting women who are faced with these issues during what should be one of the happiest times of their life. We have found that most of the women we serve 
are not in a position to come to the office for services. So we've started providing services in the home and in the community. In providing, we realize in providing services for the mothers, we are really providing tools to help families strive. And that's our ultimate goal at Catholic Social Services. I want to talk about one of the clients that we have served, and I think her story, Cassie's story, illustrates the positive impact mental health services can have on an individual. Cassie is a 25-year-old African-American single mother of two. She has a newborn and an eight-year-old. Her baby was born premature and had to remain in the intensive care unit for two months. Due to her pregnancy complications and frequent time off of work, Cassie lost her job. Soon after her daughter's birth, Cassie began to feel overpowered by the demands of caring for her school-aged child and dealing with a sick child where she had to go to the hospital almost every day. She became increasingly overwhelmed and saddened by the fact that she was a single parent and she had inconsistent support from the baby's father. Cassia was referred to us by Children's Hospital as they noticed what appeared to be escalating postpartum depression. And that's the good news, that they actually made the referral. To accommodate Cassie's schedule, however, CSS began providing counseling services in Cassie's home at 8.30 in the morning. This allowed her to get her older child off to school and then gave her time to go to the hospital so she didn't have to delay that with us coming to the home. Cassie quickly engaged in counseling and soon began to recognize her faulty thinking and behavior patterns that were a result of trauma that she herself had experienced when she was a child. Through counseling, Cassie began to release the pain of the past events in her life and began her journey to healing. She was specifically given tools to help her manage her symptoms, her distressing emotions. She also was supported in establishing, and this is also the good news, a healthy relationship with the baby's father and being able to establish boundaries within that relationship so that they could end up co-parenting successfully. Kathy's baby recently celebrated her first birthday, which is good news, right? Looking back over the past year, Cassie reported what she learned from her clinician means more than any words can ever express. She indicated that had it not been for the support of her CSS, or Catholic Social Services clinician, she would have spiraled into a deep depression and would not have been able to survive the past year. She specifically noted that the home-based services, the early appointment, and the hospital's actual awareness of Catholic Social Services Counseling Program enabled her to survive one of the most stressful and difficult times of her life. And unfortunately, Cassie just is one of many. But um, we know that counseling can work and it can make a difference. So with the support that we've received, we know that this program can make a difference in the lives of, of women and their children in Columbus. And I thank you for that. Thank you. And I'm going to ask you, are there any challenges, gaps that you're seeing um, based on the work that you do in the community? I think the challenge is many of our parents, we recognize the fact that many of our parents, because of transportation, childcare, or even the fact that they're dealing with the depression, it's hard for them to get to us. So I think the challenge is always for us to be able to find time to get to them. The other good thing about this, I think there's a network of providers that are providing services. The fact that we got the referral from Children's Hospital, the fact that I heard an earlier program um, speak about the, the poem program, mm -hmm. that we actually work with them. So I think there is the, the good part is there are a network of people providing services to these moms that can make a difference. I think we just need more of that. And I think that's, that's what this work does for us. Thank you. So when you're saying we need more of that, we, do we need more relationships? Do we have enough providers to provide the services for the women? Just, I need you just to share a little bit more. I think it's both. I think one of the things, Catholic Social Services works with two groups of people, seniors and families. So in our senior network, there's kind of a resource of network that kind of gets seniors tied into services that they need. I think with, with the family side, with our mothers, I think we need more connections to that. I think there are opportunities like the Moms to Be program, the, the poem program, the, thing, the, the um, 
celebrate one, those are opportunities for us to network and begin to talk about those families and do more together. And I think there's a need to actually let the community know that these services are available. And I think that's the other issue that we want to do in the coming year. The last question is, are you able to um, communicate? I'm writing a note here. Are you able to meet the um, the demand of individuals that, if if so, if Children's Hospital is calling you or other referrals, are you able to meet the demand of of individuals that may need your services? That is a challenge, in terms of the the number of clinicians that we have and the ability to go into the community, because just going into the home or to the community takes time. So you're not in the office and where people can come to visit you. So it is hard for us, I will say, in terms of having enough clinicians on staff to be able to go out and meet the demand. This is the last one. So, but I'm going to ask another question. But. Are there enough trained clinicians in the community to meet the demand? That's two different things that you, you know. I know. I, you I, know I, if there's enough people to do that. And if you don't know, fine, we'll try to ask some research about it. But because you've got to have, I mean, you can say there's a need, but you have to have people in the community who are trained to be able to do the work. I can't, I, I don't know. Okay. I, I don't know. I know that for us, the, the referrals that we get from either, the, it could be the Van Buren Center, it could be Children's Hospital, it could be POEM, it could be the services that are, meet, that are working with these parents that we go out and see. Uh, it, it can be a lot for us to meet the challenge to the referrals that we get, and we try to do that because we know it's a need. But sometimes we have to put people back and set up a time for us to go see them. I, I, so I can't really answer that. I can only speak from our perspective okay. about how we try to meet the demands when we get a referral. Okay. Well, thank you certainly for coming down and doing the work to make sure um, our families are healthy because, again, families are healthy. The mom or dad are healthy. The children are going to be healthy. Yes. And then you can continue to make sure that then these will be healthy adults moving forward. So this program is funded at $52,056. And thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Our next is from Columbus Literacy Council, the FIT program, and Ms. Reyes. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Tyson. Thank you again for the opportunity to come and present. Uh, as you said, my name is Joy Reyes, and I'm the Executive Director with Columbus Literacy Council, and I'm delighted to be here today to share some of what we've been doing. City Council funded our program entitled Families Involved Together, and this is, we shorten that to FIT. It's a multi-generational program, and your funding has helped us to leverage additional support with other funders in, this, in the city, and to where we were able to serve over 500 children through the program in 2017. One of those individuals we'll first start with the mother because the parent has to be involved in our programs and then we use those parents that want to receive additional support for their children. So our first individual, her, her name is Aminata. She came to us seven years ago from Guinea. And according to Aminata, when she first came to the US, her English language skills were virtually non-existent. So she was with us studying English for speakers of other languages. And after working with the Literacy Council for two years, she has achieved a level of reading and writing of basic English. Her speaking came much faster, but she wanted to continue to get reading and writing so that she was able to help her children. This past um, summer, she enrolled with her two children, ages four and five. She was very concerned that she wanted her children to be prepared for kindergarten. So during the FIT program, we worked with her on skills to for her to take home and work with her children, and we also worked with her children, ensuring they knew the alphabet and counting and things that are required for kindergarten. We're pleased to say that her children were successful in the program, but more importantly, Aminata gained the skills that help her 
be confident in the home and confident with teaching her children. She stated, I am thankful for Columbus Literacy Council. I am now able to help my children when they start school next year. Aminata is an immigrant. She was a language learner. She's a single parent and she's a mother. And in all avenues, she achieves success. With the Literacy Council, the word we've been using is kind of a play on my name, but it's joy. What joy we experienced when we saw her have the joy of being able to be a parent that teaches her own child. We have hope that her children are now on a path to be self-sufficient and successful for their future. We had another individual I'd like to share. Her name was Bree. When Bree finished the FIT program, she came to the office and said, could you please keep me enrolled with my boys? I just want to stay a part of the program. She'd made new friends. She'd enjoyed the time that she'd spent with her children. Now Bree, she's a native English speaker. She speaks English fluently. She was struggling with her reading. She'd been involved in a local program for job placement, but after six weeks of an eight-week program, she was referred to us because that program finally realized her issue was literacy. She's very adept at hiding it. She was very adept at covering up and coming up with other techniques and strategies for being successful until it came time for her to actually be on the spot, no, no multiple choice. She had to read and answer, and she expressed her uh, inability to do so. So she came with us. We have been working with her. We're continuing to work with her as an adult that speaks English, learning to read. If they're not already at an eighth grade level, it can pose multiple challenges. But more importantly, she wanted her children to be successful in school. So she joined our program, and we helped establish a routine for in-home reading. Bree and her mother now read 30 minutes a day to their boys. And um, since she's been part of the FIT program, we've helped her get library cards, and they're able to go check out books. One of the comments that she made to us was she said, it's so exciting when we go. The kids want to buy a book instead of a toy at the store. So we feel like with her, too, that we have joy. We see joy when they get a new book. We see joy as they're reading. We see joy on Bree's face as she sees her children being able to read and learn from her. She's a native born, a high school graduate, yet she was at a, when she first entered, was at a fourth grade reading level. So, and she's a single mother under the age of 25 with two boys. When we see those types of things, we know that they're there's just continues to be a need there, but that is the program that, that the council has funded. Thank you for certainly coming and sharing. What challenges are you seeing or gaps? Well, as I shared with Bree and as our, uh, as a co-community individual shared, Tyson with Impact just mentioned literacy. Since 2009, funding for adult literacy has faded drastically from the community. And when I say adult literacy, I'm not referring to those that are eighth grade and above. I'm talking about individuals that are struggling with a second, third, fourth grade reading level that have the capability of learning more. They just have not had the programs to help them. Many of them are high school graduates, so they go off the, our radar as not even being um, an individual that needs assistance. This past summer, we did a Breaking Barriers Summer Youth Employment Program funded through Franklin County. We had 189 youth, ages 14 to 24. We administered a TABE test, which is the test of adult basic English. It's a national standardized test. 170 of the youth scored below grade level, averaging a fifth grade level. These are individuals that are graduating tomorrow, these are individuals that have already graduated. We were appalled. And when we looked at that, and we've, we've been going over it, talking with the board and other individuals in the community, we believe that even though lots of money is being funneled into early education, which we believe is important, we believe we're missing the adults in the home. We believe we're, we're lacking, again, in adult literacy. That the funding, the funding's there for us to serve the kids 
of some of the people that need the help. But to expand our service and serve more of the individuals that need the assistance with adult, adult literacy, it's not there. They can't be successful with jobs. They can't be successful in work placement programs. We've expanded all of those in the Central Ohio community. But where, we're, where we believe there's a tremendous gap is with the core of the ability to read to be successful with native English speakers. Well, Joy, uh, <clears throat> thank you for, one, um, sharing the story for um, uh, Amin Ada, as well as Bree's story, which are two different stories, but certainly um, lack the skills, the literacy skills for them to be successful with their families. And then, as you said, that you provided hope to those families. And also for sharing that there is still a tremendous need for adult literacy. And uh, I know that, like I said, Kim stands as writing notes also, and so am I. But to hear that uh, you worked with 189 youth and took the tab, the TAB test, and 170 of them were reading at a fifth grade level. And that is a concern, because we're always going to be concerned about, um, one, um, our workforce in the future, mm -hmm. but also just concern about those the individuals and not being able to live their best quality of life if they're not literate they can't go and get a job they're not they're going to go to do other things and so because they're in our community so i appreciate you um, sharing that that significant need in our community and i thank you for the work that you're doing and you are receiving for the uh, families involved together the fit program sixty nine thousand one hundred and fifty dollars yes thank you for your leadership Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Our next presenter is going to be um, from the uh, Ethiopian Taiwahito Social Services. And we're, oh, mm -hmm. I see Dr. Ash falls in the room, but you're going to have um, the director of the adult services, um, Dr. Leroy. Boy Kai is going to present today. So how are you? I'm well, thank you. Good. Uh, thank you. The floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Council Member Priscilla Tyson. We at Ethiopian Tiwahiro Social Services are once again pleased to be a provider for the Human Service Program for Employment Services. On behalf of the Board of Directors, staff, and the New Americans, and the New American communities we serve, we want to thank you for the support you have given to our organization that has allowed us to help with closing the gaps in employment services for new Americans and low-income residents in Columbus. In the current fiscal year, as in the past, ETSS is pleased to report that we have again exceeded the outcome benchmarks of our city contract. We achieved 129% for both in enrollment and employment. Thus, the next area of need in workforce preparation and training that ETSS has identified is workforce preparation and training of job seekers for higher paying positions through specialized certificate programs such as the National Career Readiness Certificate and building stronger relationships with employers to hire refugees and immigrants with professional backgrounds in positions related to their career pathways. We are seeking partnership with and financial support from Columbus City Council to expand our current program to include additional training for individuals who are currently in entry-level employment to obtain career readiness certification for higher paying positions, as well as developing a new program that includes strategic partnerships with employers to maximize the potential of foreign trained refugee and immigrant professionals in our community. To help curtail brain waste, ETSS is undertaking a new initiative called Integrating Foreign Trained Professionals to help the many doctors, lawyers, engineers, accountants, teachers, and others who make their way to Central Ohio to rebuild their careers. Finally, let me share our program's overall success story with you. 
In the last three years of operation, we have served 555 clients, an average of 185 per year. Of those 555 participants, 419, or 76%, have received employment, while the others have received English language and civics education instruction. As of now, we know of four Somalis, three Congolese, and a larger number of Bhutanese who have bought their own homes after being employed through our program. One new success story is a Congolese we placed in a position at J.C. Penney a year ago who is in the process of obtaining a higher paying position as an electrician at the J.C. Penney Logistics Center on Scarborough Boulevard. This service has indeed demonstrated high achievements for many immigrants and refugees in Columbus who would otherwise not have had such opportunities and for that ETSS is grateful for the funding that has allowed those achievements to occur. I want to thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leroy. First of all, for um, exceeding your goals for the grant and also um, sharing that the number of individuals have been able not only to receive employment within the city of Columbus, but also um, are purchasing homes in our city. Right. And uh, that's because of, you said, the grant, but most important, the grant that provides the dollars to do the great work that ETSS does in our community. Um, you just stated that um, there is, seems to be a gap in terms of individuals that come here, that are here, that have higher skill sets, that are not able to be placed in positions that recognize their abilities and their skills um, in the city of Columbus. Mm -hmm. And that you are um, looking to one, you want to expand your work to be able to do that. And so I would think that as you heard earlier from um, um, Ms. Jones, that we will start to cycle again for new grants in um, part of July, I think the applications will go out and that may be an opportunity to also share that this area of um, expansion. But also, um, I just wanted to, uh, again, just say thank you for the work that you're doing. And you may want to also, and I don't know if you're already connected to, as you heard the speaker today mm-hmm. from, um, from Impact, yes. that there may be an opportunity to be doing some partnerships with Impact mm-hmm. to looking for um, positions that are going to pay more money, that's Mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. But again, I think that um, we probably should have more conversation about what you're wanting to do or what your, the career readiness certification program and these strategic partnerships to be able to help other individuals. So I'm very interested in learning more about what you're going to be doing there. All right. So I thank you for what you've um, been doing in your community from the um, ATSS. And presently, you are funded at $276,600 to provide the current um, services um, to our um, our residents. That's correct. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is is going to be representing a legal aid, and I think we have uh, oh the the director is coming. Hi, how are you, Kate? Good, good to see you. Floor is yours. You can announce who you are. I'm just talking to you. But thank um, you. Well, good morning, Councilwoman Tyson. Um, my name is Kate McGarvey, and I'm the director at the Legal Aid Society of Columbus. I want to thank the City of Columbus for its continued assistance um, and support of our supporting and stabilizing women in transition program. As you know, the Legal Aid Society of Columbus is a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to improving the lives of the poor through representation in civil legal matters. Our office provides representation in housing, public benefits, education, um, including representing children who are being suspended or expelled, um, as well as those children with disabilities who are not getting the services that they need. With employment law, senior document work, tax, consumer, reentry, 
including record sealing um, and CQEs or certificates for qualification of employment, a limited immigration practice, as well as domestic law. The Supporting and Stabilizing Women in Transition program funded by the city allows LASC to provide services to women who are separating from abusive spouses or partners and who are attempting to establish financial independence. During this project, we have helped women transition out of abusive relationships by providing advice and counsel on developing a stabilization plan, providing referrals to other social services agencies, as well as full representation in divorces, custody, and other civil procedures. In an effort to provide holistic services, LASC's advocates have also recognized that many of the women we serve rely on public assistance programs to ensure healthy and safe environments for themselves and their children as a bridge towards independence and self-sufficiency. Other women face, um, many of these women face barriers when attempting to secure these benefits, and we've been able to utilize our expertise from our benefits attorneys to help. Similarly, many of these women face issues with evictions or debt, which are threatening their ability to transition from a healthy to a healthy and safe environment. And we are able to tap into um, our staff in those areas as well. Beyond our in-house resources, we're lucky to have been able to collaborate with Choices, Ohio Domestic Violence Network, Asha Ray of Hope, as well as many others to ensure that our clients receive the support they need. We're on target uh, to serve between 125 and 150 women by year's end. One of those women um, was Diana. She was referred to us from the city's prosecutor's office and was separating from her abusive um, and volatile husband with whom she shared three children. Because of her husband's manipulative, unpredictable, and erratic behavior, Diana found herself having to frequently call off of work. Work attendance was also difficult because her husband refused to take any responsibility for the day-to-day -day needs of their shared three children. LASC helped Diana develop a safety plan and ultimately helped her initiate divorce proceedings. We obtained temporary orders which provided parenting time, structure, and also financial support throughout that transition. Because of that, Diana could maintain her job and was able to provide a safe and nurturing environment for herself and her family. In terms of challenges, which I've heard you ask the other presenters about, um, a continual challenge for us is just the number and amount of need in this area. We see far, far more women who need these services than we are able to provide, especially when it comes to extended representation. Divorces, custody cases are time consuming, um, and so there is a gap there between individuals who are in need of those services to help them transition from abusive relationships to those that we are able to provide um, with the current resources that, that we have as an organization. Thank you. Kate, can you just give me, um, yeah. in terms of numbers, the number of people that are um, requesting your services and, and in regards to, in reference to, the um, the numbers you're able to meet. Yeah, I can. I will follow up with you on exact numbers. Um, in general, we're able to serve about 20% of the individuals who contact us for services. Domestic is one of our highest areas of unmet need, um, and some of those cases we're able to serve, but not at the same level that the individual wants services. So we provide brief services or counsel and advice instead of full representation because of a lack of resources. Can you just share with the viewing and listening audience what has happened to the other 80% that you're not able to serve? Um, so there's a variety of different things. We do try to provide um, self-help materials so that individuals can go through that process on their own. We have developed videos to walk people through that process. But in truth, it's really hard to navigate the court system on your own, especially if you are going through a process where you've been abused by the other party. Um, and so oftentimes women stay in relationships because it is difficult to navigate that process on their own, um, or others may end up without that financial support or set parenting plan that they need to really make that, make that complete um, that complete bridge and really secure that independence. All right, Kate. Um, thank you for coming down and sharing. Thank you for um, sharing the 
the success story of Diana based upon your help, and you are receiving $50,000 to provide these services. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for having us. You're welcome. Thank you. Our next presenter um, and organization is going to be Voice Corps. And I think, hi, hi, I'm, see Mark. Yes. Good to see you. How good are you? you? Thank you so much. Thank you. The floor is yours. I guess it's a good day now. Again, I am Mark Jividen, Voice Corps Reading uh, Service Executive Director, and accompanying me today is David Noble, who is our um, Marketing and Development Director. I wish to express our thanks for this opportunity to speak to you once more about our service to the community and the challenges of the future. Voice Corps has been addressing the needs of those who live with vision loss for uh, a very long time, whether they're young or old, uh, all ethnicities, uh, having a range of vision loss and also extending to um, physical kinds of maladies as, uh, uh, as in uh, muscular dystrophy or a neuro, uh, neuro uh, muscular kind of thing or the challenges of dyslexia. Since 1975, we've read aloud more than 15,000 daily editions, uh, editions of the dispatch, providing 30,000 hours of readings. There have been 11,000 Wall Street journals and US Today, uh, USA Today newspapers for a, an additional 22,000 hours of accessible information, 22,000 um, uh, weekly programs reading grocery and shopping ads for dozens of local stores to help consumers save money and participate in our economy, plus countless thousands of hours reading aloud from magazines and community newspapers. And if that weren't enough, on our talk interview show, The Morning Exchange, we've brought hundreds of government and community leaders into our studios to prevent information about their programs and services to help inform, educate, and entertain an otherwise isolated segment of the population. Columbus has been recognized for its progressive thinking and adaptability. The Smart City Grant helped to position us as a high-tech, forward-thinking community. Now the Age-Friendly Columbus Initiative seeks to encourage businesses to be more inclusive of our aging population, which does not look to technology for assistance, but rather looks to people. Columbus is now experiencing a graying of the population, as is most of America. Vision impairment is a reality and a disturbing consequence of that graying. Mayor Ginther, in his letter to introduce the age-friendly Columbus strategic plan, summarized, we will look at our public spaces, buildings, and parks to ensure that they are meeting the needs of everyone. We will look at our restaurants, shops, museums, and other entertainment venues to pave the way for inclusive entertainment. Voice Corps will be there. As it has been for 43 years, we will continue to provide the visually impaired members of the aged population with access to published news about these age-friendly restaurants, shops, museums, and other venues. We have adapted our service delivery to be accessible by using modern technology. Most importantly, we have maintained the person-to-person -person feel to our assistance with the narrative efforts of more than 200 members of the community who volunteer their time to read aloud for their Columbus neighbors. The city of Columbus has been a part of making lives better through Voice Corps from the beginning, and we cannot express our gratitude enough. We hope that as age-friendly and other city initiatives to serve this population are developed, the Voice Corps will be called upon to assist in the planning and implementation of these efforts as a partner with subject matter expertise and as a concerned and contributing member of the Columbus community which we are proud to call home. Thank you. Well, certainly thank you for coming and sharing um, the success of Voice Corps. Are there any challenges that, or gaps that you see in the community in regards to the work that you do? Our challenge is always one of finances, base, base finances to, to do the basic service. We have uh, a very thin staff and a very tight budget, but we continue to operate in part from reserves, which is uh, something we need, to, uh, we need to discontinue, which is in part the reason that uh, David came aboard last year in marketing and development, and we're moving forward in that area. But, uh, you know, the, the gap, uh, and we're, we're addressing here today specifically the, the aging population and the kinds 
kinds of vision impairments that come along with that. We all know people who have those problems and both by statistics and, uh, and intuition, we know that there are thousands of people out there that, that we're not reaching. Fortunately, since we're a radio broadcast service, we can reach every one of them mm -hmm. uh, if we can uh, uh, find, uh, find them, actually, uh, and provide radios. We are working on a grant right now, and we just received um, 200 new radios uh, that were uh, given to us through a, a a budget grant from the state. Uh, our challenge now for those radios, and, and, and it always is a challenge, is to find the people that, that need them and to work with other organizations. And I think we're doing a much better job of that, but we could really use assistance in outreach. Um, uh, some budgetary numbers to buy or get a team of people together that can get out there, boots on the ground, and find the people that we should be serving because we know that's our gap. Mm -hmm. Lots of people can be helped to remain in their homes, remain independent, and just live a better life, um, which leads to better health and fitness. Have you um, been working at all with Life Care Alliance? We have been, as a matter of fact, uh, to, to some degree, and it's one of the, the things on our to-do list to uh, have them, through their programs, um, uh, let us know more often when their people, uh, you know, find folks that are uh, in a condition, particularly through Meals on Wheels, to, uh, to, to use our service. Yeah, I think that would be a great connection because, um, I mean, their job is to deliver meals to individuals who are in their homes for various reasons, and so I think that would be a great connection to make. There are, you also have a um, couple other people or organizations is that um, the Central Howard Central Ohio Office of Area, Central Ohio Office on Aging, right. and they may be able to um, share some individuals, as well as um, from the administration to contact um, Fran Ryan. And Fran Ryan works with um, just our senior population. She's a senior roundtable. There are probably, I'm going to say, a hundred different organizations are a part of that. So that may, I mean, I think there, I believe that you will be able to distribute those 200 radios pretty easily through those different um, mechanisms that I just mentioned. So I, we appreciate the work that you do. I've had the opportunity, which is a joy, to come in and to read on radio to um, your audience. And it, you certainly are feeling a need in our community that um, is, is an unmet need. You are a distinct in the work that you do and just really do appreciate your work. And from the city of Columbus, you are receiving $70,000. Um, that's been the agreement. amount. we appreciate amount. that very much. Um, I would say, and I appreciate your having been on uh, the program that I mentioned, uh, uh, and I would uh, ask any, um, uh, you know, government agencies or, um, you know, the folks that are here representing other social service organizations to contact us, and we'd be very happy to feature them on uh, our programs on the radio uh, to get their word out to our population. And if there's anyone that might be watching that uh, needs our services, we're, uh, we have a website at just simply voicecore.org with applications and all the information they need to contact us or apply for service. Thank you. You also mentioned volunteers. They can go to that website too. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you so much. Our next presenter is going to be from um, Chris, and let's see, is Tara? Um, is she here? Is Chris? I want you to state your name because I'm sure you're not Tara. Tara Dungana. Okay, thank you. Oops, sorry. Good morning. My name is Tara Dungana, and I've been working for CRES, Community Refugee and Immigration Services, uh, since 2010. Uh, I'm a former refugee, recently naturalized, proud U.S. citizen now, uh, and. I think I'm kind of a representation here also of why the services that Chris provides uh, to the refugee is so important uh, because I have gone through those services and 
to the level I am here today, it's all the, all the support that I've gained from the services. So thank you, uh, Tyson and Commis uh, Commissioner Tyson and the whole city for giving us that opportunity through, through the funding resources to uh, help these new immigrant families. Uh, I manage employment program, yes, well, an employment program at Chris uh, that's, that's funded by Job and Family Services, but I'm here to speak about the city-funded program also right now. The program we call at Chris uh, through the city funding is Secondary Migrants and Family Reunification Program. Uh, Chris is a resettlement agency primarily. We resettle refugees in central Ohio. Uh, we resettled over 800 last fiscal year. Uh, this year the goal was originally 900, but uh, the new administration has uh, posed some challenges in that number. So we have shrunk down to, uh, by now we have reset all over 300. I would start with the priorities and the service needed in the communities that we serve, the gaps in other words, uh, family re reunification being one right now, uh, employment and legal services, continuum of services uh, after resettlement, we call it post resettlement services, Microfinancing for, for startups and small businesses owned by uh, immigrants and refugees. Uh, I'm an owner of a restaurant, uh, so I have some experience in that line also. Promotion of existing minority-owned businesses through city program or city websites. Transportation is a big barrier for new Americans in uh, central Ohio to gain employment, uh, basically. English language training, primarily for, for secondary families. Secondary family means family moving from other cities and states to central Ohio. These are the gaps that we have identified as, as the, the opportunity to provide services in, in future. I would share a story uh, about a client that we served through the program in the year 2017. Uh, this is a single refugee uh, from Ivory Coast, resettled in other city, uh, New York, and he was single. He didn't have a family there, so he, when after a few months of being in New York, he heard good things about Columbus. Uh, how good is Columbus uh, community in terms of refugees and immigrants' families? How supportive is the uh, community here? So he thought, I'll move there. But he didn't know anybody here when he moved in. And he, has, he had an old car. By then, he had gained a car. And when he arrived to Columbus, since he didn't know anybody, he started living in his car. Uh, he spent two weeks in his car before one of our staff member, or he came in contact uh, with one of our staff member under the city program. And the first thing first, uh, our, our program helped him gain employment. Uh, Chris currently works with over 30 local employers, uh, ranging from hospitality business, uh, housekeeping jobs, to trade. We currently have uh, employer partners like Roman Off, who does uh, uh, provide apprentice, uh, and we have, this is a one-year relation, and we have uh, uh, enrolled over 50 clients by now. Matter of fact, there were 10 that interviewed last week and are starting this Monday. So uh, my previous speaker from other uh, uh, refugee provider was talking about certification also. So these, these are the certifications that we are focusing right now. Then, uh, uh, sending people to go to schools, right? Because the apprentice will train you with the hard skills as well as certify you at, at the end of the day. So this client that I'm talking about right now has a, has a full-time permanent job now and has bought a new car recently. And uh, uh, we helped him obtain his uh, green card. That's a process uh, in, the, in the integration or resettlement. And he, we are supporting him now 
uh, bring his family through the reunification program, that family reunification program we have at Craze. Thank you again, City of Columbus. Uh, I am the third family from Bhutanese Nepali community to arrive in City of Columbus in 2009. And uh, I have been helped by Chris staff uh, then to gain my first employment in City of Columbus. So I'm so proud personally about the program. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for coming, first of all, and sharing your own personal story. Thank you for um, sharing the story of um, the... Is Diallo by the name. I'm sorry? Diallo is his name. Diel? Diallo. Is his, the name of the individual the that name, came here yeah. from New York. Yes. And now um, from living in his car to based upon the programs that um, Chris has, that this individual is now has his full-time job, has a car, and is his green card, and um, moving forward in the city of Columbus. And it's in, in process of bringing his family now. Thank you. Oh, okay. And his family will be joining him soon. Yes. And I thank you for that. Um, you shared some of the gaps that also that you're seeing here in terms of you know translation, ESL, startups, small businesses, some of the gaps that are still faced. Yeah, uh, I, I put one example there, just, just an example. Uh, uh, about the community, Bhutanese Nepali community in Columbus. Uh, that's the second largest uh, uh, immigrant community in Columbus right now, and it's growing exponentially every day. Uh, families are buying home. Uh, over 500 families have already bought home. The direct resettlement number of that community is uh, uh, may not have exceeded 1,500 if you go by head count, but the total number of uh, uh, the family members uh, from the community is over 25,000 now in Columbus, Ohio. And of that, 500 have already bought home. Uh, so uh, I think that tells like how supportive uh, the city of Columbus is. Uh, and and uh, the need is growing because uh, we know uh, some other cities and the states are not that friendly with refugee and immigrant population right now. So at my job, I get at least a, a one to two call every day, um, families from other cities and states saying like, how can I come to Columbus? How can you support us? So one of the biggest need there is uh, uh, every programs are geared towards placing individuals into jobs as immediately as possible, but the language uh, they need to be successful in the job, the language training program is, we have basic program, but uh, we wish there is a program that can support them through years so that language acquisition is not quick and easy, like you cannot gain a language over five months, it takes over years. Uh, and and we, have, we are taking different initiative right now. We encourage our employer partners make some contribution at their site and, and we support, we provide a, a TESOL certified professional to uh, help with the language there at employer site also. We have three employers right now doing that. Well, thank you. And again, sharing that language acquisition is still a challenge. Um, that there's 25,000 people now in um, our city and 500 purchase homes and congratulations on that. That's a major Thank accomplishment. Thank you for coming and sharing and um, and Chris received $60,000 for our secondary migrant for the secondary migrant program because as you know that um, when individuals where they first settle that's where the funds happen to be mm -hmm. for those individuals and then when they move to a different community then that community is really responsible there's no f dollars don't follow them there and so in our community making sure that we have dollars that are uh, with supporting Chris to be able to help um, with secondary migrants. That's very true. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next presenter is going to be um, representing, I think, Adam H. And um, Natty Ferguson is coming up to talk about, I think, the community, she's the community prevention manager. So. I'm Councilwoman Tyson, and along with me are the providers of those services and two young people who also will be speaking. Uh, and okay, you can come on this side. Yeah, you, okay, you two need to stay here, yeah, because you'll be speaking. 
Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Nettie Ferguson, and I am the Community Prevention Manager at the Alcohol, Drug, and Mental Health Board of Franklin County, and of course, is more commonly known as Adam H. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, the CEO, and our staff, we are grateful for the continued support of the, the Columbus City Council. And as a reminder, the Board does work closely with a network of providers, more than 30 nonprofits in Franklin County, to offer prevention, intervention, and treatment services. Our goal in prevention is to promote mental health and to reduce alcohol and other drug uh, uh, problems. Uh, the funds that we receive from the City of Columbus are distributed to four organizations which are standing with me today, and they do provide preventive services not only in the schools but also in the community. The organizations include Columbus Area uh, Integrated Health Services, uh, Susie Shipley Norwood, and Ania Kerr is here representing that, that organization. Community for New Directions, Donovan Gresham is here. Comp Drug, uh, we have uh, Leah Ann Greer, uh, Gina Fontancinos, which I just mispronounced, sorry. Richard Wright and um, Derek Porter, and those are the two young men that will be speaking. And also we have from Directions Youth and Families, uh, Jamal Greer. I will just give you a brief overview of the programs, and I also will mention what has been identified as some of the gaps in services uh, also. Uh, first of all, we, we, uh, the Multicultural Eastside Center of Columbus area, which we call MECCA, um, has a summer day camp and after school programs. They do work on social skills, self-esteem, esteem, decision making, conflict resolution, and healthy relationships. Uh, they did meet their projection projections, so they had uh, 144 elementary and 175 middle schools that they served in 2017. Um, they also uh, do a summer day camp in partnership with Columbus Metropolitan and Housing. Uh, the gaps in services um, that is identified for the summer program is the number of people wanting the service exceeds the number of slots available for the camps. And secondly, it's K through eighth, uh, so there's not opportunities for high school students to participate other than they serve as summer employees, as they serve as summer intern. And presently, there are no funds for summer internships, uh, which is another piece. In terms of school-based pro uh, program, the gaps in services uh, would be just being able to serve more students in the buildings that they're currently in. Uh, the success story that they identified was at the end of there in Champion Middle School on the east side. And at the end of the uh, school year, the counselor noted that the young people who participated in the school-based program, they had a decrease in their behavior issues, which meant they wasn't sent to peak or they wasn't uh, sent to the principal's office. Uh, and so they observed that. Another uh, success story is that Cesar Chavez uh, school, which they were working with Latinos, uh, there was the Women Empowerment Initiative. Community for New Directions uh, Outreach Program served 298 youth, and of course they learned about the risks associated with alcohol and other drugs uh, use, and 169 participated in the summer day camp program, and 69 young people participated in the after school program. The same is true in terms of gaps in services. Um, they again have K through A high school students come in as summer interns. Community for New Directions does set aside some funds for that, but of course the, the demand exceeds the availability of funding. Um, and C and D Community for New Directions served 120 high school, was projected to serve 120 high school students, but they served 331, uh, participating in a program around alcohol and other drugs. Their big success story is they took a look at uh, what the most neat was, and of course there was a deficiency in reading and math. Uh, and so they partnered, uh, they took a look at what needed to, to be done. They sought additional funds along with Columbus City Council funding from the C. Morris Foundation, and they were able to buy 45 tablets and also um, uh, purchase a software program, uh, which, which is called Park Tutor, which will work on improving those reading and math skills. Um, and also that this works in conjunction to what they receive in the schools. Uh, Comp Drug, which is the Positive Peer Youth to Youth Program, um, created opportunities for teens to attend uh, 
be involved in decision making and being drug free. But also uh, this year, 62 young people attended the Youth to Youth Conference supported by funding from the city. Uh, and they worked on a change in knowledge and behavior around alcohol and other drug use. And we know with the open epidemic, this is crucial in terms of making sure our young people get this information and behavior change early so they don't make those kind of decisions. Uh, 53 young people develop a plan to stay drug free throughout the year. Uh, and 36 even was more committed to just signing off on that. They actually engage with um, youth to youth on the youth advisory board. And some of these young people are here today to talk about that. Uh, do you want to speak now? <clears throat> uh, first, we want to thank you for allowing us to go to conference at a reduced rate. And with that opportunity, we um, enhanced our public speaking skills and also it strengthens our um, strengthen. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> My name is Eric Porter. I'm a senior at Eastmore Academy. I'm Richard Wright. I'm a senior at Eastmore Academy. And like you said, thank you for um, allowing us to go to conference on a reduced weight. And because of this, we are um, better our public speaking skills and strengthen our decision to be drug free and also meet other drug free teens across Columbus, Ohio and um, other states. And also we effectively learn how to communicate um, discussion groups on how to have fun without doing drugs or alcohol or tobacco or um, anything else. And also we learn how to um, create a positive change and also be a part of role model in our community. Uh, we thank you and we hope to see you at one of our conferences this year and in the summer and we have a brochure for you. And then finally, uh, we have, uh, and thank you so much for come, taking time to come from school to speak on your behalf today. Uh, and finally, we have directions for youth and families and after school and summer day camp program uh, at Ohio Avenue and Crittenden, Crittenden Center. Um, directions for youth and uh, served over 286 young people attended their camps this year. Um, and. Um, uh, Jamal will talk about their success story, but I do want to re, uh, report that 190, 119 of those young youth reported abstinence uh, in terms of alcohol and other drug, drugs for over three months. One of the gaps in services, again, is, as we have said in the other ones, um, when you start serving high school students, uh, the availability of uh, funds to do some type of uh, employment or youth leadership um, is not available in, in the funding that they currently receive. And you want to talk about the success yes, story? Yes. Hello, my name is Jamar Green. I'm uh, the team lead at Ohio Avenue Youth Center, along with the recruiting coordinator. Um, two seconds to pull up my success story, I'm sorry. Okay, I um, did a success story. I'm also the basketball coach over at the Ohio Avenue Youth Center. Um, we won a championship last year for our first time putting the team together, and uh, we play in the championship Saturday for back-to-back -to, -back to repeat, so wish us good luck on that. Um, but I actually wrote my success story on one of our basketball players named Rashad Leonard. Um, I chose to write my success story on Rashad Leonard. Um, he is 13 years old and is a member of the boys' basketball team here at the Ohio Avenue Youth Center. Uh, coming into the season, he lacked confidence, the ability to play with older boys, and also struggled with this displaying consistent behavior around the program. So I spoke with him in regards to some of the expectations I had for him this year. I told him, obviously, I wanted him to play, and I, um, I wanted him to be a role model for some of the younger kids. Um, he is a re relatively small guy, but has a huge heart. Uh, he challenged himself to overcome the fear of making mistakes and to become that role model that I expected him to be. Um, he has continued to work hard on the court each and every day, and in reward, has actually earned a starting spot this year. Um, I'm really proud of Rashad uh, because I know he has an uh, a few outside issues that he has to deal with on a daily basis, but he has continued to show resiliency and perseverance through it all. I look forward to seeing what future holds for him. Thank you. Councilwoman Tyson, we thank you and thank the city for the funding to be able to offer these services to our community. And uh, we also um, thank you on behalf of the, the Board of Trustees for the continued support that the city uh, provides to Adam Age as a whole. Do they yes. want to? Go ahead. Johnny Bat. My name is <laughs> Gina uh, Fontana Rosa. I work, I'm the Youth Services Coordinator at Youth to Youth. My name is Leanne Greer, and I'm a Prevention Assistant. 
Susie Shipley Norwood, and I'm the program manager for the Multicultural Eastside Center of Columbus area, which is our school and community-based prevention program. My name is Nikita Kerr. I'm a prevention outreach specialist through the at Columbus area. I'm Alan Progression. I'm the director of AOD Services at Community Progression. <laughs> So I want to, Nettie, thank you for coming down and certainly sharing um, the programs that Adam H. is able to fund based on the dollars that, we re that you receive. Um, it is always a pleasure to see um, young people come to council and to share how these dollars are supporting them because you are absolutely our future. And we um, just appreciate the programs that you're in and, that, and the leadership you have taken in those programs. And I'm very excited because I went to Eastmore when it was Eastmore <laughs> High School, and I, uh, so I'm always happy to see individuals that come into council chambers from Eastmore Academy. So I would say um, thank you for that. But also that you are leading drug-free teams, teams and that um, I know all the programs are focused on young people not being involved in um, you know, using drugs or alcohol, being smoke free. And when you do those things, you certainly will have a greater opportunity to be successful in life. You'll be successful healthfully in, in terms of your health. Um, and certainly, um, but again, being leaders and being young leaders, I really do appreciate the leadership that you guys have taken. I want to say thank you to the, all the administrators and that are here that are helping our young people to be successful. Thank you for your commitment to them and showing them and leading and guiding them so they can continue to have their best quality of life. And to your um, directors and presidents of your organizations, go back and tell them that I've said thank you um, for sending this great team of people down here to share the success stories of um, these organizations. So thank you for coming down. I hope you have back-to-back um, -back championships. Uh, <laughs> appreciate the story that you showed, talked about with um, Jamar Green. Look at Jamar's right. Jamar, Mr. Jamar Green and um, building his confidence, um, you being a role model for him, um, based on the, so the challenges he faces at home, but how you have been, uh, all of you are role models to our young people. So I thank you for coming down and uh, look forward to being able to present the, the dollars. I think, I don't have the, this one, I don't think Adam H is on my sheet. I don't see it on here, but I think it's over 200 and, I, I'm, like, I'm trying to remember by memory from every year, 200 by 80, $288,000 you guys know $288,000 to support your programs and again make sure you go back and tell your um, uh, well Adam H make sure you are uh, making sure you're applying for the funds that, um, that the applications will come out in July okay okay I've heard your needs too and we know that there's a significant need of, of providing you know work work opportunities for young people and um, the purpose of this hearing is not, you know, was not just to hear the success stories or hear, to hear that you've hit your goals. I said earlier, because all of you have hit your goals. For me, it's now about um, what are the gaps? What are the gaps? And Colum the city of Columbus by itself cannot fund all the gaps. But I do believe that as a collective city, once we have a list of all the needs that we have in our community, that there is a way to be able to meet these needs. So thank you very much for coming down, and I wish you all much success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you taking a picture of them? Oh. Well, he wants to take a picture of you guys, so if you guys go stand. Our next presenter is going to be from um, with hands on hands on Central Ohio can start walking up. We're going to take Carl's. Thank you. Well, I see that Ernest is um, Ernest Perry, the president and CEO, is here. But uh, Miss Tiffany Wright, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. Thank you. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, Councilwoman Tyson. It's always good to be with you. Uh, today I have with me Tiffany Wright, who
who's our Senior Director of Finance and Grant Administration at Hands On Central Ohio. Uh, she works very closely with Mr. Stans to support the administration of our uh, contract with the city, and she's going to share some of the successes of the last year and talk to you about where we're going next. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Tyson, for the opportunity to share with you the impact of the partnership between Hands On Central Ohio and the City of Columbus through the Human Services Funding. Through this partnership, we are able to provide a single point of access to Columbus's <coughs> to Columbus's Health and Human Service Resource System, providing residents with a simple three-digit extension to dial when in need, 211. 211 is recognized in Columbus and similar communities as the critical first link to programs and service, service interventions charting basic needs and social determinants of health. Human Services funding supports our effort to maintain 211 as a free service to Columbus residents. I'd like to share a story about Anna, who relocated to Columbus from Puerto Rico after surviving Hurricane Maria to illustrate the value of 211 as a city resource. Anna, her husband, and two children survived Hurricane Maria, but they were struggling, as all citizens of Puerto Rico continue to do. As we know, they are still lacking electricity, clean water, food, and stable, excuse me, food and stable, safe places to live. In an effort to provide safety and stability for their family, Anna and her husband decided to relocate and they chose Columbus as their new home. However, due to lack of economic resources, the decision was made that Anna would relocate with her seven-year-old daughter and her husband and teenage daughter would join them when they could. Anna arrived here with one suitcase and very little money in her pocket. She had a friend who had offered a residence and a place to live and they, they sought resources to help Anna. Through, they, through their search, they learned about 211. Anna called and was able to speak with one of our bilingual INR specialists to whom she expressed a need for a place to live, furniture, food, clothing, and a school for her daughter. Our specialist was able to send her information via email, but because of the apparent language barriers, went even further to help her by calling area agencies on her behalf to see what assistance was available. Anna was eventually able to find a stable and safe place to live, the furniture she needed, food, clothing, and a job. She was able to enroll her daughter in school, and her daughter is now learning to speak English and is thriving. Her husband has been able to join them, and he too has been able to find part-time employment through the help of 211. And in January, they were able to bring their teenage daughter over to join them, who is also now enrolled in school. Thanks to the help of 211, Anna is safe and happy in her new home. Every day, hundreds of families like Anna's depend on 211 for housing, food, clothing, and just basic needs. The human service funds made available to Hands On Central Ohio allow us to provide this. Looking ahead, our impact will continue to, um, to serve Ohio by continuing to make it easier for people to access emergency food through the expansion of our food line chat and text service. We have a plan to phase this access to the entire city of Columbus by the end of 2018. We also want to deepen our partnership support for Celebrate One by providing drop-in access to the emergency crib distribution program at our offices located at 195 North Grant Avenue. Lastly, we want to make 211 trends available to the general community that illustrate the collective impact efforts and smart Columbus initiatives through reports like 211 Counts that was released at the beginning of the year. Thank you for your time. And to get more information about our community or about our organization, you may reach us by dialing 211 or going to the website at 211centralohio.org. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Wright, for coming down and sharing. Are there any gaps that you're seeing um, in our community that need to be met because of the work that you do with um, uh, that 211 does, focusing on, as you mentioned, you know, housing, food, clothing? Um, what gaps are you seeing in our community? Sure, we're seeing a number of gaps and I think the work that we've got lined up for the coming year is, uh, is designed to support some of those gaps in service. Uh, food continues to be a huge issue in this community. Uh, just last week we had in our office Sarah Nykirk who was the executive director of, uh, of Call back, back in the 80s. And many of the trends that she shared with us about the need for food and housing continue to drive the bulk of our work today. And so expanding our uh, access citywide for easy emergency food is a huge issue in this community that we intend to continue to support. Um, the work around Celebrate One and infant mortality is huge. Um, access to emergency crib distribution 
is one of the priorities that they set forth. We do not currently have enough sites in the city where people can access emergency cribs on a drop-in basis. Um, there are a number, number of scheduled places to go, uh, but those places have limited hours, and so we're trying to fill the gap in service there. Anytime we can get another partner to step up and be a drop-in site, that, that certainly advances the work of that community uh, effort. Uh, and then just pr pr beginning to provide more information about the general trends that we're seeing around the community. Um, at at Hands-On Central Ohio, we have seen requests for services increase over 20% in the last year and that's after a 20% increase in request the prior year. Uh, and so there are a lot of stories that are baked into those, those requests for services and the increases. Uh, in particular, we're seeing uh, more than 5% increase in, in needs in areas like the Hilltop and South Linden and the Hilltop. We're, we're seeing a need for comprehensive wraparound services for families, very complex issues uh, with multiple people. Uh, and so we need, you know, skilled uh, people and interventions to be able to engage and start to resolve those crises. Uh, and in South Linden, we're seeing what, what appears to be the beginnings of uh, an affordability issue around housing in general. Uh, we're seeing a rise in the need for basic needs, food, furniture, rent and utilities assistance. And so there are so many stories uh, within the data that we'd like to sort of elevate and get awareness on so that people who are making decisions and planning and, and distributing funds can certainly target those in the most strategic ways. And those are the things that we're going to be working very hard to advance over the next year. Thank you, um, Mr. Perry. And, you know, I'm glad that, you know, Kim Stans is here because he's taking, he's, he's feverishly writing down all these needs because I think you and I have spoken in the past and something that is that and, and uh, Mr. Stans and I had this conversation yesterday and with Mr. with Michael Corey I want to say his name once today that um, we really do have to get our arms around I think the, around the what are the true what what are the need, true needs of our community and that's why I'm asking these questions because I do believe that I think some of the data that you have worked on um, this year and sharing that data you have a great understanding of the needs in various communities in the areas that you are focused on and that we really do have to begin to say here's what uh, in terms of the human services needs in our community, here is the real number. Here is the real number. And obviously, you know, from, and from there, then we have to think about strategically, how do we get to um, making sure that we're identifying opportunities from the public sector, the private sector, to think about how do we get to the dollar amount that we need for the services in our community. And because of the numbers are growing. And so I think that, um, just like we just heard from the, youth, the young people here before, young people need jobs. And if they have jobs, that, that stops them from doing other things that they, they have idle time, they do things that they're not necessarily needing to be doing. So we've just got to get that number figured out. And I think that you, with your data, um, would be someone as you're trying to pull people together to figure this all out, to be helpful in saying, here's what, Colum here's what the true human service needs are. I know there's a study getting ready to come out about the econ um, um, the economic benefits, I don't use that word, of the human service agencies, but um, again, people, the number of people are working, the, the amount of money they're bringing to the community, that's great to have that number, but you also have to have the number of what the true need is in this community. And like we have for other major organizations in this community have, have come together to, and now that we know what those numbers are and they're working to try to get the dollars amount that are needed to meet the true need, that absolutely has to happen with the human services organizations. It has to. Because if, if Sarah came to see you and we're dealing with the same issues that she talked about 20 years ago and we're still talking about them 20 years later, there's something not right with that picture. So. I'll leave it at that before I, you know, I'll leave it at that, but it's something <laughs> not right with the picture and that we've got to start thinking about it from a very different way. And I think you have great data to share with that. So I thank you for coming and sharing. You're, you guys are just 
a partner with the city. You are really the city. And um, thank you, uh, Ms. Wright, for sharing Anna's story um, with our viewing and listening audience. And I appreciate you were able to, to help meet all the needs that she had. And now she's being able, she and her family can hopefully thrive in the city of Columbus. Thank you so much. And, you. and your amount is, um, let's see, $192,659 from this particular grant. I know you and I are partners on other things in terms of food access. And I appreciate also your leadership as chairing um, the board of the local food action plan. And uh, you're doing a fabulous job. Thank you. So the next presenter is Thoughtwell and Dr. Lynette Cook. And then after um, Thoughtwell will be the Center for Healthy Families. And I know that we have um, our board member, Jewel Garrison, is here representing them as well as, I'm going to look at my phone. Um, I'll make sure I get this right. Um, and who will be coming up is Aubrey Jones is here. All right, so um, Dr. Cook, the floor is yours. Good morning, Council Member Tyson. Thank you, not only for the ongoing support of the city and of you personally, but also for inviting us to be here this morning. As you know, we received this current year, we receive $133,784 in funding from the city. That funding goes to help support the data and research needs of many of the organizations that you've already talked to in these hearings, not the least of which is our good friends at Hands On, um, we were the data geeks behind the 211 report, and we were thrilled to be able to put that one out. Um, so the 211 counts report, um, some focus groups on behalf of the Women's Commission to understand the needs of women in our community. Um, we're working in par partnership with James Raglan and the Kerwin Institute at The Ohio State University um, on the Near East Side's uh, needs assessment that's just about to be released. We also worked with the Columbus Council on World Affairs and the Global Report, understanding uh, global competency in our community, as well as the human trafficking report that was started with your prior colleague, uh, former council member Klein, who's now district attorney, um, uh, doing some work on understanding the human trafficking issue in this community. Um, so we do a number of reports. Our goal is to support data-driven decisions in the community so that you and your fellow leaders in the community have the information that you need to make decisions about the investments that you are making um, on your own and in partnership with your peer funders around the community. Um, you've asked lots of the folks around the community what they see as challenges, the human services area, and I would say Research is always one of those things, you know how well the nonprofits in this community are working on a dime and trying to be as efficient with their dollars as possible because of the uh, uncertainty at the federal level and especially with tax reform and how the tax reform might impact uh, um, donations, right, to nonprofits, there's a lot of uncertainty. And so we're seeing a real hesitancy on the part of nonprofits who need and want good quality data and research they're saying, we're not sure how funding is going to pan out for us going forward, so we're going to be a little more cautious about research reports. And so having the partnership of the city as well as our other partners, the county, the United Way, and Ohio State, allows us to do some of this work on their behalf so that they can get the information that they need. So as always, thank you so much for your support. Thank you, um, Dr. Cook. And just quickly, what are you seeing as some of the challenges in our community? Well, certainly the opioid crisis, housing is a big one. Um, we're still seeing great racial disparities um, in all of those areas. I would say it's really that, that combination of health, housing, and employment all together. Um, and it's, as you know, once a family has an issue in one area, so for example, if there's a health issue, then that impacts job, and then stress in the family impacts the kid's ability to do well in school, and it's also well tied together that any one thing happens and things fall apart. Again, thank you for your leadership and certainly your partnership working with our um, nonprofit organizations and also working with um, this body and the county so that we have good data to be able to um, share with our residents about the, the needs of our community and look forward to our ongoing relationship with you. And I know you just mentioned you get about $133,000 from the city to do that work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
And our final presenters this afternoon are going to be Aubrey Jones. She's a Healthy Families Connections Program Director for the Center for Healthy Families, and Joel Garrison, who is a board member. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. The floor is yours. On behalf of the Center for Healthy Families, our board and staff, and Tashia Safford, our president and CEO, I'd like to say thank you for your support in funding our programs this year. Thank you to Council Member Priscilla Tyson for your support of the Center for the Center for Healthy Families and commitment to the advancement of pregnant and parenting teens. Because of your support, we are able to hire resource advocates that are highly qualified, licensed social workers, trained in evidence-based practices to work with our pregnant and parenting teens and their families. We work to ensure that their babies were born healthy and surpassed their first birthday with critical interventions such as removing barriers to prenatal care appointments and safe sleep presentations, which includes a pack and play provided by Cribs for Kids. All of this was informed by our dedication to infant mortality reduction, working with our partners leading this work in our community. Teen pregnancy and parenting contribute significantly to high school dropout rates among high school girls. 30% of teenage girls who drop out of high school report pregnancy and parenthood as the primary reason. At the center, our program works to help teens defy the odds. Our program, in our program, 74% of our pregnant and parenting teens that were high school seniors graduated as compared to the national average of 40%. Additionally, nine in 10 were able to delay a subsequent pregnancy, pregnancy which we know is critical to self-sufficiency outcomes. Each year in our community, 1,000 teens give birth. That means that at any given point, we can estimate that there are about 4,000 pregnant and parenting teens in our community. I am proud to say that last year, our program served over 275 pregnant and parenting teens, their babies, and their families. Nevertheless, more families need our services. This week, I sat next to a young mother as she participated in a forum for formerly homeless youth, and I got goosebumps as she shared her experience of staying in a shelter with her newborn. And she shared her experience of working with her resource advocate that connected her with Transitional Living Program, where she now feels safe and stable. And she's looking forward to the next steps in her life. I got goosebumps because I'm proud of the work we do, but also because I know that there is a need for more funding for more services. Thank you for your time, and again, your investment in the futures of pregnant and parenting teens, their babies, and our community. We're very excited that we've completed 10 years of service um, in this community. Um, the city has been one of our key supporters in that effort, and we're extremely appreciative of that. Um, we've learned some really important lessons. One of the things we, we've learned is that teens don't fit our structure, and so our structure has to be responsive and reflective of what's going on in their lives. Um, they're experiencing things that we could not imagine sitting behind a desk. Our staff are out holding hands, finding teens, locating family members, and sometimes stepping in the way of harm um, to prevent our teens from experiencing um, things they're not prepared to experience. They want to have good jobs. They want to have safe homes. They want to have healthy babies. Our staff is prepared to help with that. We also know that initially our staff were hired based upon their willingness to do work, um, their willingness to understand issues teens were experiencing. As more and more uh, we looked at those issues, we learned that we need a higher skill level than we've had initially. We have that now. We're very proud of our staff. We need to make sure that we continue to hire staff with good mental health backgrounds, able to help some of the crises that our young people bring in the door with them, really not knowing that they're in crises because that's their everyday life. Um, we are proud to do the work we do. We recognize that we don't want to be in competition with some of our partners at the table. So we're very clear about 
um, the dollar requests that we make, how we use those dollars, and that they're in concert with the goals we've set uh, with our partners at the table. So I'm asking everyone about the challenges that they're seeing and the gaps. And, and I know that this listing, if, you're, if you have a thousand pregnant teens in our community each year and you're serving about 275 of those, would you say that the gap, that is one gap, that you're not able to meet the needs of uh, a significant number of our young people that are in our community that are um, pregnant teens? That's correct. Mm -hmm. What other challenges are you seeing in regards to the work that you're doing um, um, within the community? Just, you know, what, what's needed to make sure that they continue, that these young people are having healthy babies so we don't have any issue, you know, that they're living past their first, bir first birthdays, that our young women are, are able to, and men, um, are able to stay in school and be successful. Are there, are there cha other challenges that, or gaps that you're seeing? I think that the gaps that um, our staff uh, work really hard on are the gaps that will impact the trajectory of that young person's life. For example, a lack of childcare or affordabil affordability of childcare for high school students. Um, we still have in our community um, young people who um, are now parenting and still high school students and are either forced to drop out or have alternative uh, educational placement, which may not be the best way for them to learn uh, and graduate from high school because of childcare barriers. And then the other thing that we work really hard on is safe and stable housing. Um, oftentimes with young people, um, they don't, not only are we explaining the lack of the resource, um, but sometimes it's the realization that um, for the first time, you can do everything you're supposed to do and it, the resource still isn't there. So you can be graduated from high school and working full time in a livable wage job or a job that's going to put you on a career path and still not be able to afford fair market rent in our community. Sometimes that's very difficult for a young person to process um, and we work really uh, hard to make sure that we eliminate those barriers but also, like she said, stand in the way of some of those uh, realities and try and buffer them because ultimately the goal is self-sufficiency and, and they need to be resilient enough to, to keep going and keep trying. Okay. And can you just share, and this, this will be the last question, so um, once a, the a young person has their child, what's the timeline that you continue to maintain contact with the mm -hmm. individuals? Typically, uh, we follow a pregnant teen uh, past the child's first birthday. Um, we have two, up to two years of service delivery, so if you think of a young person coming to us, ideally in their first trimester of pregnancy, um, we would follow them sur uh, surpassing that child's first birthday. But we also uh, serve parenting teens. Um, even occasionally, we have a young person that will come to us um, and maybe didn't have services with their first pregnancy, but they have had a subsequent pregnancy and um, are still maybe trying to graduate high school or find safe and stable housing, and they'll come to us at that point, and we will still follow them and provide them up to 24 months of service delivery. Okay. All right, and the last question, was, that was supposed to be it, but it's not. I have to ask this last question about, you mentioned housing. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me the issues of housing for our, our teens. The number one uh, issue is afford affordability. Um, when we go to look for housing in, in the community that a young person, uh, most of us at 18, 19 uh, had the similar jobs and we, they just don't, they're not enough uh, money to pay for, mm -hmm. for what's out there. Um, the other thing is that we're working with young people, and so we know that uh, maintaining safe and stable housing comes with a skill set that you have to have in order to maintain that. Um, and so a lot of the services that we are providing are about life skill development. We have young people who have never seen or had a model of what uh, responsible life skills look like. Uh, so oftentimes they're learning for the first time in a, in a moment where it means something. Mm -hmm. They're not learning life skills in a class, they're learning life skills 
in life. Right. And so it, it's really important for us uh, and our resource advocates to not only counsel them on what might happen in the future and how to handle those things, uh, but also walk them through so that when we close the case and we're gone, they're able to do it on their own. So it's, it's not only affordable housing, it's safe and stable and affordable. We certainly know in our community, we, we need almost 50,000 50, units of affordable housing. And uh, cert, it's a, we know that mm -hmm. there's a number of people working on it. And, um, and, you know, there's affordable housing, there's workforce housing, you know, workforce housing is, you know, housing that is, um, that you're making, you know, maybe $30,000, $35,000 or $60,000 to low workforce housing, but still, um, and then even though if you have child care, child care can be very expensive. And so we were, you know, I think there's going to be some new initiatives that we're going to hear about uh, soon that for individuals that make under the 1350, there may be some opportunities for some people that I think would be, could be very helpful um, that may have child care linked with it and some other things. So that, that's exciting. But we definitely know that um, there is a need for workforce housing, and there's certainly a need for just affordable housing. With the changes that are also going on at the federal level, um, we know that organizations like CMHA only have so many vouchers that, you know, how do we get individuals or um, 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 individuals that are um, pro providing housing, how do we get them to you know, provide housing to individuals who are not making significant amounts of money and um, that is safe housing, as you just said, it's safe and stable. So it is a challenge and that's why we're here to listen and try to figure out what is it that this whole community needs can try to do to, to help meet that need. So Just, just one other point, I, I don't think we're purporting our participants moving into their own environment. Sometimes it comes with a whole family that's already established and helping that family even learn how to, to provide the kind of environment that their teen needs to live in. Yeah. And as you've heard today, um, and it really does start interesting, it starts with, you know, um, our infants. When we earlier we heard from the Safe and Sound program from um, the Y the Y W C A, and the work that they're doing. These are with you know individuals who happen to be fam families that are homeless, but their children are are within our Safe and Sound pre pre K program, uh, and um, it, it and then providing the working with Children's Hospital to provide the uh, behavioral health programs for those children. And that's the same throughout. I mean, I think that if we are providing the, well, the basics, food, safe, shelter, um, housing, et cetera, just some basic needs, and then you have to start thinking about the safety needs of, and well, safety is part of that basic need. But, you know, um, the social determinants health, of health play a significant role in all of this. Right. They really do. Mm -hmm. And um, so we heard of you know, trauma-informed care, uh, because individuals, if you're young and having a baby in a household that's not as safe, that's trauma. Yeah. And how do we deal with that? So these are all I mean, areas that we're talking about, and that's why we're asking all these questions, because we need to really begin to look at human services in a way that, um, that what is what is really needed in terms of a true human service pro plan for the, for a city like Columbus, and um, so I thank you for the work that you're doing, um, for all these young men and women that are have the uh, opportunity to be in your program, that to get the the case management that they need, which is so important. I thank you for that. Um, and uh, for these babies being born healthy past their first birthday, I, I thank you for that because if that weren't the case, mm -hmm. uh, our, our infant mortality numbers would continue to rise. So you're making a significant contribution to lowering the infant mortality rate in the city of Columbus. Mm -hmm. 
and you're doing all that and you're receiving $76,000 and um, so around $76,065 from the city of Columbus. So I thank you for the work that you do. Thank you, Jewel, for being mm -hmm. a board member and being so committed to the organization, I know, for the last 10 years. And um, I also um, thank you for your leadership being such a, um, an advocate for our young people and the work that you do with them. And overall, I want to say thank you to um, your present CEO, Tashia Safford, for her her commitment for truly caring about the young people in our program, and also to your um, the leader of the organization that had the, the the vision to start this program is Donna James. And so, just appreciate. Um, your work. And with that, I am going to get ready to adjourn our, our hearing. Before I adjourn, I want to thank the leadership staff and the volunteers of the organizations who have joined us today. Never forget that you are doing doing some of the most noble work that people can do in the service of in the service of others. I am deeply grateful to your service and I admire each and every one of you for your compassion and your tenacity, ultimately making our community a better place to live. We are planning to have legislation on, council agen on council's agenda for the social service grant funding on Monday, March 26th. And as I conclude, I also want to thank the following people for their work. Hannah Reed, Hannah Jones, and Kim Stans from the Department of Development, the professionals at CTV who, make, who work so hard to prepare for and broadcast these hearings, my team, Nicole Harper and Carl Williams, my fellow council members and their remarkable staff members who work hard every day for the residents of Columbus. And lastly, the residents of Columbus who allow us to do this work and who make our city the best place to live, work, and to raise a family in the city of Columbus. Thank you, and this concludes our hearing for today. Thank you.